Podcastle, episode 802 for Tuesday the 29th of August 2023. Part 1 of Quests of the Starstone by C.L. Moore and Henry Kuttner. Read by Caitlin Zivanovich and rated PG-13 with a content note for torture. Good morning, good day, good afternoon and good evening and welcome to Podcastle, the flying castle of fantasy fiction. I'm your host, Matt Dovey, and it's my pleasure to present for your enjoyment part one of Quest of the Starstone by C.L. Moore and Henry Kuttner, narrated by Caitlin Zivanovich. This story was first published at Weird Tales in 1937, but you'd be surprised how punchy it is and how well it holds up. Catherine Lucille Moore, January 24, 1911 to April 4, 1987, was an American science fiction and fantasy writer who most often used the pen name C.L. Moore. She was among the first women to write in either genre. Moore's work paved the way for many other female speculative fiction writers. She and her first husband, Henry Kuttner, were prolific co-authors under their own names and three pseudonyms, Florence O'Donnell, C.H. Liddell and Lewis Paget. Henry Kuttner, 7th April 1915 to 4th February 1958, was the author of many sci-fi and fantasy short stories in the 30s, 40s and 50s. He was one of the Lovecraft Circle and contributed a number of elements to the Cthulhu mythos. Some of Cutner and Moore's works have been adapted for film. Their short story, The Twonky, was filmed in 1953, while Mimsy with the Borough Groves was adapted into The Last Mimsy in 2007. Their What You Need was adapted as an episode of The Twilight Zone, and Kuttner's The Graveyard Rats was adapted as a segment of Trilogy of Terror 2 and an episode of Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities. Kuttner is not as well known as many of his contemporaries, mostly due to his death at the relatively young age of 42. Your narrator is our own Caitlin Zivanovich. Caitlin is a former Marine Corps intelligence officer and current speculative fiction writer. She is a graduate of the Viable Paradise Workshop and writes short stories to avoid editing her novel. She currently lives in Poland with her husband and four loud children. You can find her on Twitter at kzivanovich and at copyfoil.io slash v slash Caitlin Zivanovich. And now pay attention, for our tale is about to begin. And if you don't pay attention, you'll be out of your depth with no idea how to get home. Quest of the Starstone by C. L. Moore and Henry Kuttner. Narrated by Caitlin Zavanovich. Jarell of Jory is riding down with a score of men at her back, for none is safe in the outer lands from Jarell's outlaw pack. The vaults of the wizard are over full and locked with golden key, and Jarell says, if he hath so much, then he shall share with me. And fires flame high on the altar fane in the lair of the wizard folk, and magic crackles and Jarell's name goes whispering through the smoke. But magic fails in the stronger spell that the Jory outlaws own, the splintering crash of a broadsword blade that shivers against the bone. And blood that bursts through a warlock's teeth can strangle a half voiced spell though it rises hot from the blistering coals on the red-hot floor of hell. The rivet-studded oaken door crashed open, splintering from the assault of pike-butts, whose thunderous echoes still rolled around the walls of the tiny stone room revealed beyond the wreck of the shattered door. Jarell, the warrior maid of Jory, leaped in through the splintered ruins, dashing the red hair from her eyes, grinning with exertion, gripping her two-edged sword. But in the ruin of the door, she paused. The mail-clad men at her heels surged around her in the doorway, like a wave of blue-bright steel, and then paused too, staring. For Franga, the warlock, was kneeling in his chapel. And to see Franga on his knees was like watching the devil recite a paternoster. But it was no holy altar before which the wizard bent. The black stone of it bolt huge in this tiny, bare room, echoing still with the thunder of battle. And in the split second between the door's fall and Jarell's crashing entry through its ruins, 
Frenga had crouched in a last desperate effort at... at what? His bony shoulders beneath their rich black robe heaved with frantic motion as he fingered the small jet bosses that girdled the altar's block. A slab in the side of it fell open abruptly as the wizard, realizing that his enemy was almost within sword's reach, whirled and crouched like a feral thing. Blazing light, cold and unearthly, streamed out from the gap in the altar. So that's where you've hidden it, said Jarell with a savage softness. Over his shoulder, Franga snarled at her, pale lips writhed back from discolored teeth. Physically, he was terrified of her, and his terror paralyzed him. She saw him hesitate, evidently between his desire to snatch into safety what was hidden in the altar and his panic fear of her sword that dripped blood upon the stones. Jarell settled his indecision. You black devil, she blazed and lunged like lightning, the dripping blade whistling as it sheared the air. Franga screamed hoarsely, flinging himself sidewise beneath the sword. It struck the altar with a shivering shock that numbed Jarell's arm, and as she gasped, a sound that was half a sob of pain and fury, half a blistering curse, he scurried crabwise into a corner, his long robe giving him a curiously amorphous look. Recovering herself, Jarell stalked after him, rubbing her numbed arm but gripping that great wet sword fast, the highlights of murder still blazing in her yellow eyes. The warlock flattened himself against the wall, skinny arms outstretched. Where he you yo? he screamed desperately. Where he? Where he you? What devil's gibberish is that, you dog? demanded Jarell angrily. I'll Her voice silenced abruptly, the red lips parted. She stared at the wall behind the wizard, and something like awe was filming the bloodlust of her eyes. For over that corner in which Franga crouched, a shadow had been drawn as one draws a curtain. Where he? screamed the warlock again in a cracked and strained voice, and how could she not have seen before that door against whose panels he pressed, one hand behind him pushing it open upon darkness beyond? Here was black magic, devil's work. Doubtfully, Jarell stared, her sword lowering. She did not know it, but her free hand rose to sign her breast with the church's guard against evil. The door creaked a little, then swung wide. The blackness within was blinding, as too much light is blinding, a dark from which she blinked and turned her eyes away. One last glimpse she had of the gaunt, pale face of Franga, grinning, contorted with hate. The door creaked shut. The trance that had gripped Jarell broke with the sound. Fury flooded back in the wake of awe. Choking on soldier curses, she sprang for the door, swinging up her sword in both hands, spitting hatred and bracing herself for the crash of the heavy blade through those oaken panels so mysteriously veiled in the shadow that clung about the corner. The blade clanged shiveringly against stone. For the second time, the agonizing shock of steel swung hard against solid rock, shuddered up the blade and racked Jarell's shoulders. The door had vanished utterly. She dropped the sword from her nerveless hands and reeled back from the empty corner, sobbing with fury and pain. C coward she flung at the unanswering stone. Hide in your hole then, you fiend, begotten runaway, and watch me take the star stone. And she whirled to the altar. Her men had shrunk back in a huddle beyond the broken door, their magic-dazzled eyes following her in fascinated dread. You womanish knaves, she flared at them over her shoulder as she knelt where the wizard had knelt. Womanish, did I say? Ha! You don't deserve the flattery. Must I go the whole way alone? Look then, here it is. She plunged her bare hand into the opening in the altar from which streamed that pale, unearthly light, gasped a little involuntarily, and then drew out what looked like a block of living flame. In her bare hand, as she knelt, she held it, 
and for minutes no one moved. It was pale, this star stone, cold with unearthly fire, many faceted yet not glittering. Jarell thought of twilight above the ocean, when the land is darkening and the smooth water gathers into its surface all the glimmering light of sea and sky. So this great stone gleamed, gathering the chapel's light into its pale surface, so that the room seemed dark by contrast, reflecting it again transmuted into that cold, unwavering brilliance. She peered into the translucent depths of it so near her face, she could see her own fingers cradling the gem, distorted as if seen through water. And yet somehow there was a motion between her hand and the upper surface of the jewel. It was like looking down into water in whose depths a shadow stirred, a living shadow, a restlessly moving shape that beat against the prisoning walls and sent a flicker through the light's cold, blue-white gleaming. It was... No. It was the star stone, nothing more. But to have the star stone, to hold it here in her hands at last, after weeks of siege, weeks of desperate battle, it was triumph itself she cradled in her palm. Her throat choked with sudden, ecstatic laughter as she sprang to her feet, brandishing the great gem toward the empty corner through whose wall the wizard had vanished. Ha! Behold it! she screamed to the unanswering stone. Son of a fiend, behold it! The luck of the star stone is mine. Now a better man has wrested it from you. Confess, Jory, your master, you devil deluder. Dare you show your face? Dare you? Over that empty corner the shadow swept again, awesomely from nowhere. Out of the sudden darkness creaked the door's hinges, and the wizard's voice called in a choke of fury. Bell's curse on you, Jory. Never think you've triumphed over me. I'll have it back if I... If I... If you... What? Do you think I fear you, you hell-spawned warlock? If you... What? Me you may not fear, Jory. The wizard's voice quavered with fury. But by Set and Bubastis... I'll find one who'll tame you if I must go to the ends of space to find him, to the ends of time itself, and then beware. Bring on your champion. Jarell's laughter was hot with scorn. Search hell itself and bring out the chiefest devil. I'll lift the head from his shoulders as I'd have lifted yours with one sweep had you not fled but she got for answer only the creak of a closing door in the depths of that shadow. And now the shadow faded again, and once more empty stone walls stared at her enigmatically. Clutching the star stone that, so legend had it, carried luck and wealth beyond imagination for its possessor, she shrugged and swung around to her soldiers. Well, what are you gaping at, she flared. Before heaven, I'm the best man here. Out! Out! Pillage the castle! There's rich loot of that devil's servant, Frenga! What are you waiting for? And with the flat of her sword, she drove them from the chapel. By Farrell, Smith, have you lost your taste for Seeger? I'd as soon have expected old Marnock here to sprout legs. Jarl's cherubic face was puzzled as he nodded toward the waiter, who was moving quickly about the little private drinking booth of polished steel, in the back of the Martian tavern, placing fresh drinks before the two men, regardless of his artificial limbs, lost, some said, during an illicit amorous visit to the forbidden dens of the spider women. Northwest Smith frowned moodily, pushing the glass away. His scarred, dark face, lighted with the pallor of steel-colored eyes, was morose. He drew deeply on the brown Martian cigarette that smoked between his fingers. I'm getting rusty, Jarl, he said. I'm sick of this whole business. Why can't something really worth the effort turn up? Smuggling? Gun running? I'm sick of it, I tell you. Even Seeger doesn't taste the same. That's old age creeping up, Jarl advised him owlishly above the rim of his glass. Tell you what you need, N.W. A snort of... The green mingo liqueur old Marnock keeps on his top shelf. 
It's distilled from panty berries, and one shot of it will have you prancing like a pup. Wait a minute, I'll see what I can do. Smith hunched over his folded arms and stared at the shining steel wall behind Jarl's vacant chair as the little Venusian slid out of the booth. Hours like these were the penalty of the exiled and the outlaw. Even the toughest of them knew times when the home planet called almost intolerably across the long voids of the spaceways. And all other places seemed flat and dull. Homesickness he would not have admitted to anyone alive. But as he sat there alone, morosely facing his dim reflection in the steel wall, he found himself humming that old sweet song of all Earth's exiled people, the green hills of Earth. Across the seas of darkness, the good green earth is bright. O star that was my homeland, shine down on me tonight. Words and tune were banal, but somehow about them had gathered such a halo of association that the voices which sang them went sweeter and softer as they lingered over the well-remembered phrases, the well-remembered scenes of home. Smith's surprisingly good baritone took on undernotes of homesick sweetness, which he would have died rather than admit. My heart turns home in longing across the voids between to know beyond the spaceways the hills of earth are green. What would he give just now to be free to go home again? Home without a price on his head. Freedom to rove the blue seas of earth the warm garden continents of the sun's loveliest planet. He hummed very softly to himself. And count the losses worth to see across the darkness the green hills of earth. And then let the words die on his lips unnoticed as he narrowed steel-colored eyes at the polished wall in which a moment before his dim reflection had faced him. It was darkening now, a shadow quivering across the bright surfaces, thickening, clouding his mirrored face. And the wall, was it metal or or stone? The shadow was too thick to tell, and unconsciously he rose to his feet, bending across the table, one hand hovering back toward the heat gun on his thigh. A door creaked open in the dimness, a heavy door, half seen, opening upon darkness beyond, too black to gaze on, Darkness and a face. Are your services for hire, stranger? quavered a cracked voice speaking in a tongue that, despite himself, sent Smith's pulses quickening in recognition. French, Earth's French, archaic and scarcely intelligible, but unquestioningly a voice from home. For a price, he admitted, his fingers closing definitely on his gun. Who are you and why do you ask? And how in the name of, it will reward you to ask no questions, said the cracked quaver. I seek a fighting man of a temper strong enough for my purpose, and I think you are he. Look, does this tempt you? A claw-like hand extended itself out of the shadow, dangling a double rope of such blue-white pearls as Smith had never dreamed of. Worth a king's ransom, croaked the voice, and all for the taking. Will you come with me? Come where? To the planet Earth, to the land of France, to the year of 1500. Smith gripped the table edge with one frantic hand, wondering if the seeger he had drunk could somehow have sent him into paroxysms of dream. By no stretch of imagination could he really be standing here, in this drinking booth in a Martian tavern, while out of a door that opened upon darkness, a cracked voice beckoned him into the past. He was dreaming, of course, and in a dream it could do no harm to push back his chair, skirt the table, step closer to that incredible door thick hung with shadows, take the outstretched hand over whose wrist the luminous pearls hung gleaming. The room staggered and whirled into darkness. From somewhere far away he heard Jarl's voice shouting frantically, N.W., wait! N.W., where are you going? And then, night too black to gaze on blinded his dark, dazzled eyes, and cold, unthinkable flamed through his brain. And, and, he stood on a green hilltop, whose gentle slope rolled downward to a meadow, where a brook wound with the sound of rippling water. Beyond, on a high upthrust of craggy rock, 
a great gray castle loomed. The sky was blessedly blue, the air fresh in his nostrils with the sweetness of green growing things. And all about him rolled grassy uplands. He took a deep, deep breath. The green hills of earth. N.W., what in... By Farrell, I... Hell's blazes, man, what happened? Jarl's spluttering amazement jolted him out of his delight. Smith turned. The little Venusian stood on the soft grass behind him, two small glasses full of pale green liquid in his hands, and a look of almost idiotic bewilderment on his good-looking, cherubic face. I come back into the booth with the panty juice, he was muttering dazedly. And there you are, stepping through a door that, damn it, that wasn't there when I left. And when I try to pull you back, I, I, well, what did happen? You stumbled through the gateway, uninvited, said a cracked voice ominously behind them. Both men whirled, hands dropping to their guns. For a dazed moment, Smith had forgotten the voice that had lured him into the past. Now, for the first time, he saw his host, a small man, wizened, dark, stooping under his robe of rich black velvet, as if the evil reflected on his seamed face were too heavy to bear upright. Dark wisdom glinted in the eyes that stared malevolently at Jarl. "'What's he saying, N.W.?' demanded the little Venusian. "'French. He's speaking French,' muttered Smith distractedly, his gaze on the lined and evil face of their host. And then to the warlock, "'Qui est vous, monsieur? Pourquoi?' "'I am Franga,' interrupted the old man impatiently. "'Franga the warlock.' and I am displeased with this blundering stranger who followed us through the door. His speech is as uncouth as his manners. Were it not for my magic, I could not guess his meaning. Has he never learned a civilized tongue? Well, no matter, no matter. Listen now, I have brought you here to avenge my defeat at the hands of the Lady of Jory, whose castle you see on yonder hilltop. She stole my magical jewel, the Star Stone, and I have vowed to find a man who could tame her if I had to search outside my own world and time to do it. I am too old myself, too feeble now. Once, when I was as young and lusty as you, I won the jewel from a rival, as it must be won, bloodily in battle, or its magic is void to the possessor. Two, it may be given freely and maintain its power, but by neither method can I take it from jewelry. And so you must go up to the castle and in your own way win the stone. I can help you a little. This much I can do. I can put you beyond the reach of the pikes and swords of Jory's men. Smith lifted an eyebrow and laid his hand lightly on his heat gun, a blast of whose deadly violence could have mowed down a charging army like wheat ripe for the scythe. I'm armed, he said shortly. Franga frowned. Your arms would not avail you against a dagger in the back. No, you must do as I say. I have my reasons. You must go beyond the gateway. Cold, pale eyes met the wizard's veiled stare for a moment. Then Smith nodded. It doesn't matter. My gun burns as straight in any land. What's your plan? You must get the Lady of Joyry through the gateway, the same gateway by which you came hither. But it will take you into another land where... Where, he hesitated, where there are powers favorable to me and therefore to you. Make no mistake, it will not be easy to wrest the Starstone from Jory. She has learned much of the Dark Lore. How shall we open the gateway? Franga's left hand rose in a swift, strangely archaic gesture. By this sign, learn it well, thus and thus. Smith's gun-calloused brown hand imitated the queer motion. Thus? Yes, and the spell must be learned as well. Franga mouthed something queer and garbled, Smith echoing him with twisted tongue, for the words were as strange as he had ever spoken. Good, the warlock nodded, and again the strange syllables came incoherently from his thin lips. Again his hand moved, giving the gestures an oddly cadenced rhythm. When you voice the spell again, the gateway will open for you, as it opens now for me. Silently, a shadow swept down upon them, dimming the sunlit hill. In its midst, a blacker oblong darkened, 
The creak of a door sounded faintly, as if from enormous distances. Bring Jory through the gateway, the wizard whispered, vicious lights crawling in his cold eyes, and follow. Then you may seize the Starstone, for the powers in this other land will fight with you. But not here, not in Jory. You must follow me. As for this little man who blundered through my door of darkness, he is my friend, said Smith hastily. He will help me. Eh. Well, let his life be hostage then to your success. Win me the stone, and I stay my wrath at his stupid interference. But remember, the sword of my magic hovers at your throat. A shadow quivered over the wizard's black-robed form. His image quivered with it as a reflection in troubled water shakes, and abruptly shadow and man were gone. By great feral, articulated Jarl in measured syllables, will you tell me what this is all about? Drink this, you look as though you need it. As for me, he thrust a small glass into Smith's hand and drained his own drink at a gulp. If all this is a dream, I hope there's liquor in it. Will you kindly explain? Smith threw back his head and tossed the panty spirits down his grateful throat. In crisp sentences, he outlined the situation. But though his words were brisk, his eyes lingered like a caress over the warm, sweet-scented hills of home. Er, no, said Jarl when he had finished. Well, why are we waiting? Who knows, there may be a wine cellar in that cozy-looking castle over there. He licked his lips reflectively, tasting the last of the green liqueur. Let's get going. The sooner we meet the woman, the sooner she'll offer us a drink. So they went down the long hill, earth's green grass springing under their spaceman's boots, earth's warm June breezes caressing their Mars-burned faces. The gray heights of Jory loomed above the two before life stirred anywhere in the sunny midday silences of this lost century. Then, high in the buttresses, a man shouted, and presently, with a rattling of hooves and a jangle of accoutrements, two horsemen came thundering across the lowered drawbridge. Jarl's hand went to his heat gun, and a smile of ineffable innocence hovered on his face. The Venusian never looked so much like a Raphael cherub as when death was trembling on his trigger finger. But Smith laid a restraining hand on his arm. Not yet. The horsemen bore down on them, visors lowered. For a moment, Smith thought they would trample them down, and his hand hovered ever so lightly over his gun. But the men reined to a halt beside the two, and one of them, glaring down through his helmet bars, roared a threatening question. "'We're strangers,' Smith told him, haltingly at first, and then more easily as long-forgotten French flowed back into his memory. "'From another land. We come in peace.' Few come in peace to Joyry, snapped the man, fingering his sword hilt, and we do not love strangers here. Have you perhaps... A covetous gleam brightened the eyes half hidden by the visor. Gold? Or gems? Your lady can judge of that, fellow. Smith's voice was as cold as the steel-gray eyes that caught the man's gaze in a stare of sudden savagery. Take us to her. The man hesitated for an instant uncertainty eloquent in the eyes behind the visor. Here was a dusty stranger, afoot, swordless, unarmed. Such a fellow as Jory's men might ride down on the highway and never notice twice. But his eyes were the eyes of... of... He had never seen such eyes. And command spoke in his cold, clipped voice. The soldier shrugged inside his mail and spat through the bars of the helmet. There's always room in Jory's dungeons for one more varlet, if our lady doesn't fancy you, he said philosophically. Follow me, then. Jarl, plodding across the drawbridge, murmured, Was he speaking a language, N.W., or merely howling like a wolf? Shut up, muttered Smith. I'm trying to think. We've got to have a good story ready for this, this Amazon. Some brawny wench with a face like a side of beef, speculated Jarl. So they entered Jory, over the drawbridge, under the spike porticullus, into the high-vaulted, smoke-blackened banquet hall, where Jarrell sat at midday table. Blinking in the dimness, Smith looked up to the dais at the head of the great, T-shaped board where the Lady of Jory sat. 
Her red mouth glistened with the grease of a mutton bone she had been gnawing, and the bright hair fell flaming on her shoulders. She looked into Smith's eyes. Clear and pale and cold as steel they were, and Jory's yellow gaze met them with a flash like the spark of meeting blades. For a long moment there was silence between them, and a curious violence flamed in the silent stare. A great mastiff loped to Smith's knee, fangs bared, a growl rumbling in its furry throat. Without looking down, Smith's hand found the beast's head, and the dog sniffed for a moment, and let the man rough its shaggy fur. Then Jarell broke the silence. Tigre! Isi! Her voice was strong and suddenly deeper in timber, as if emotions she would not acknowledge were stirring in her. The mastiff went to her chair and lay down, finding a well-gnawed bone to crack. But Jarell's eyes were still fast on Smith's, and a slow flush was mounting her face. Pierre, was all, she said. Who is he? I bring you news of treasure, said Smith, before they could speak. My name is Smith, and I come from a, a far land. Smeet, she murmured, Smeet. Well, what of this treasure? I would speak to you alone of that, he said guardedly. There are jewels and gold guarded by thieves, but ripe for the harvesting, and I think jury harvests well. C'est vrai. With the luck of the star stone, she hesitated, wiping her mouth on the back of a narrow hand. Are you lying to me? You who come so curiously clad, who speak our language so strangely? Always before I have seen the lie in the eyes of the man who tells it, but you... Suddenly and so quickly that despite himself, Smith blinked. She had flung herself across the table, leaning there on one knee, while the slender blade of her dagger flickered in the air. She laid the point of it against Smith's bare brown throat, just where a strong pulse stirred beneath sunburnt flesh. He watched her without a quiver of expression, without twitch of muscle. I cannot read your eyes, Smeet, Smeet. But if you are lying to me, the point dented the full swell of his muscular throat. If you are, I'll strip the skin from your carcass in Jory's dungeons. Know that. The blade fell to her side. Something wet trickled stickily down Smith's neck inside the leather collar. So keen was that blade he had not known himself scratched. He said coldly, Why should I lie? I can't get the treasure alone. You can help me win it. I came to you for aid. Unsmilingly, she bent towards him across the table, sheathing her dagger. Her body was one sweep of flowing grace, of flowing strength, slim as a sword blade, as she half knelt among the broken meats upon the board. Her yellow eyes were cloudy with doubt. I think there is something more, she said softly, something you have left untold. And I have a memory now of a yelling warlock who fled from my blade with certain threats. The yellow eyes were cold as polar seas. She shrugged at last and stood up, her gaze sweeping down over the long table, where men and women divided their time between feasting and fascinated staring at the tableau by the table head. Bring him up to my apartment, she said to Smith's captors. I'd learn more of this treasure. Shall we stay to guard him? Jarell's lips curled scornfully. Is there a man here who can best be with steel or anything else? She demanded. Guard yourselves, you cravens. If you brought him in without getting a poniard in the belly, I can safely talk with him in the heart of Jory's stronghold. Well, don't stand there gaping. Go! Smith shrugged off the heavy hand laid on his shoulder. Wait, he said crisply. This man goes with me. Jarell's eyes dwelt on Yara with a velvety, menacing appraisal. Jarl's sidelong black stare met hers eloquently. Brawny wench, did I say? he murmured, in the liquid cadences of high Venusian. Ay, the Minga maidens were not more luscious. I'll kiss that pretty mouth of yours before I go back to my own time, lady. I'll... What is he saying? He gurgles like a brook, Jarrell broke in impatiently. He's your friend? Take them both, then, Voisin. 
Jarrell's apartment lay in the top of the highest tower of Jory, at the head of a winding stone stairway. Lofty roofed, hung with rich tapestries, carpeted with furs, the place seemed to Smith at once alien and yet dearly familiar with a strange, heartwarming familiarity. Separated from his own time by dusty centuries, yet it was earth-sprung, earth-born, reared on the green hills of his home planet. "'What I need,' said Jarl carefully, "'is some more Minga liqueur. Did you see how that hellcat looked me over? Black Feral, I don't know if I'd sooner kiss her or kill her. Why, the damned witch would run her sword through my gullet on a whim, for the sheer deviltry of it. Smith chuckled deep in his throat. She's dangerous. She... Jarrell's voice behind him said confidently, Wait behind the door, Voisson. These two strangers may visit our dungeons after all. This little one. How are you named? He's called Jarl, Smith said curtly. Yes, Jarl. Well, we may find means to make you a taller man, Jarl. You would like that, eh? We have a little device, a ladder, which I got from the Count of Gores when he visited me last summer. And the Count is clever in these things. He does not speak your tongue, Smith interrupted. No? It is not strange. He looks as though he came from a far land indeed. I have never seen a man like him. Her eyes were puzzled. She half turned her shoulder to them, toying with a sword that lay on a table at her side, and said without looking up, Well, your story, let's have it. And yes, I'll give you one more chance at living. If you're lying, go now. None will stop you. You are strangers. You do not know Jory, or Jory's vengeance. Over her shoulder she slanted into Smith's eyes a level glance that burnt like the stab of lightnings. Hellfires flickered in it, and despite himself, Smith knew a sudden crawl of unease. Jarl, though he did not understand the words, whistled between his teeth. For a heartbeat, no one spoke. Then, very softly in Smith's ear, a voice murmured, She has the star stone. Say the spell of the gateway. Startled, he glanced around. Jarrell did not stir. Her lying yellow eyes were still brooding on him with a gaze that smoldered. Yara was watching her in fascination. And Smith realized abruptly that he alone had heard the cracked quaver of command in, yes, in Franga's voice, Franga the warlock whispering through some half-opened door into infinity. Without glancing aside at Jarl, he said in the ripples of high Venusian, Get ready. Watch the door and don't let her out. Jarrell's face changed. She swung round from the table, her brows a straight line of menace. What are you muttering? What devil's work are you at? Smith ignored her. Almost involuntarily, his left hand was moving in the queer, quick gesture of the spell. Phrases in the unearthly tongue that Franga had taught him burned on his lips with all the ease of his mother tongue. Magic was all about him, guiding his lips and hands. Alarm blazed up in Jarrell's yellow eyes. An oath smoked on her lips as she lunged forward, the sword she had been toying with a gleam in her fist. Jarl grinned. The heat gun danced in his hand, and a white-hot blast traced a trail of fire on the rug at Jarrell's feet. She shut her red lips on a word half-uttered, and twisted in midair, flinging herself back in swift terror from this sudden gush of hell flame. Behind her, the door burst open, and men in armor clanged into the room, shouting, dragging at their swords. And then, down swept the shadow over the noisy room. Cloudy as the sweep of the death angel's wings, it darkened the sunny air so that the ray from Jarl's gun blazed out in dazzling splendor through the gloom. As if in the misted depths of a mirror, Smith saw the men in the door shrink back, mouths agape, swords clattering from their hands. He scarcely heeded them, for in the far wall, where a moment before a tall, narrow window had opened upon sunlight and the green hills of earth, was a door. Very slowly, very quietly, it was swinging open, and the black of utter infinity lay beyond its threshold. Hi, Salele, Smith! Jarl's warning voice yelled in the darkness, and Smith threw himself back in a great leap as he felt a sword blade prick his shoulder. 
Jarell sobbed a furious curse and plunged forward, her sword and sword arm a single straight bar. In the dimness, Jarl's gun hand moved, and a thin beam of incandescence burned bright. Jarell's sword hissed in midair, glowed blindingly, and then dripped in a shower of white hot drops to the stone floor. Her momentum carried her forward with a hilt, and a foot of twisted steel still gripped in her stabbing hand, so that she lunged against Smith's broad chest, thrusting with the stump of a ruined sword. His arms prisoned her, a writhing fury that sobbed wild oaths and twisted like a tiger against him. He grinned and tightened his arms until the breath rushed out of her crushed lungs, and he felt her ribs give a little against his chest. Then, vertigo was upon him. Dimly, he realized that the girl's arms had gone round his neck in a frantic grip as the room swayed, tilted, dizzily, amazingly, revolving as though on a giant axis, or as if the black depths of the gateway were opening under him. He could not tell, nor was he ever to understand just what happened in that fantastic instant when nature's laws were warped by strange magic. The floor was no longer solid beneath his feet. He saw Jarl twisting like a small, sleek cat as he stumbled and fell, fell into oblivion with his gun hand upflung. He was falling himself, plunging downward through abysses of dark, clasping a frightened girl whose red hair streamed wildly in the wind of their falling. Stars were swirling about them. They were dropping slowly through stars while the air danced and dazzled all around them. Smith had time to catch his breath, and flex the muscles of his gun thigh to be sure the comforting weight pressed there before a spongy ground received them softly. They fell like people in a nightmare, slowly and easily, with no jar upon the strange dim surface of the land beyond the gateway. And welcome back. That was part one of Quest of the Starstone by C.L. Moore and Henry Kuttner. And if you enjoyed that, well, come back next week to hear the conclusion. I'll leave any thoughts on the tale until that point too. So, hopefully, I'll see you then. In a manner of speaking. That was our show for this week. On behalf of everyone at Podcastle, your co-editors Shingai and Jerry Kugunda and Eleanor Arwood, Assistant Editor Caitlin Zivanovich, Audio Engineers Devin Martin and Eric Valdez, Forum Moderator Ossicat and our many wonderful first readers, Andrew Cahoe, Craig Jackson, Amalia Harrington, Julia Pat, Kieran Corsini, Ryan Cole, Sarah S. Messenger, Sophie Barker, Shrikripa Krishna Prasad, Tarva Nova, Tierney Bailey, Zeev Witties, and myself, Matt Dovey. Thank you for letting us share another story with you. The Legal Bit Podcastle is part of the Escape Artists Foundation, a 501c3 non-profit, and this episode is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. That means you can share it, and please do, but you cannot sell it and you cannot change it. If you want specifics, check creativecommons.org. Our music is by Shiva in Exile. Everything we do on Podcastle is 100% donor funded and if you'd like to support what we and the rest of EA do please join us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash EA podcasts prefer another method? there's details for supporting us via Twitch Amazon Prime Ko-fi and PayPal on escapeartist.net we'll be back next Tuesday with another fantastic tale in the meantime you might care to check our sister podcasts Escape Pod for Science Fiction Pseudopod for Horror Cast of Wonders for YA Speculative Fiction and Cats Cast for Speculative Cat Stories. If your heart belongs to us, though, we'll see you next week. Be safe and be kind.